history, let's talk about the English Revolution. So what we have happening here is really a discussion about where should power reside in a state. What we have done last few lessons was talk about absolutism in the French state, the Russian state. England would be no different in that the king tried to have an absolute amount of power or full power in the state for the English people to rebel. And so we see a movement towards what we would call a constitutional state. And that's what we're going to be covering here today, the English constitutional monarchy, which is actually a process over about 100 years in the 1600s. <clears throat> so the background for this actually goes back to 1215 with an important document called the Magna Carta. The nobles will force the king to sign this document, or the Great Charter it's also called. And it creates this contract between the king and these nobles, or aristocracy. <clears throat> but essentially what this Magna Carta does is limit the power of the kings. That's why this is so important. And that's why this document, or this Act of Parliament, was one of the first ones on your assignment for the Acts of Parliament. <clears throat> this requires the king to obey the laws, and two key principles allowing due process of law and habeas corpus. So it's going to give some basic legal rights to the people of England. The queues have a right to a jury trial, and there's a process by which um, they go through to be convicted of a crime. The king also has to ask for um, consent for taxation. So this is the idea that the king asks, now in this case for England, it's not quite a parliament yet. Parliament will come in England. He's asking for consent for taxation. So there was a group of, <clears throat> there is a group of advisors to the king that's model parliament in the late 1200s. So when he has to ask for, for consent of taxation, this is something called, in parliamentary terms, the power of the purse. So the king has to ask the parliament for money to spend. And this is a radical idea, and this is limited to England. Although I have to tell you, this concept comes to the United States, comes to our colonies, and is part of the United States today. And this phrase of the power of the purse is actually something I've heard the last few months um, in the United States, actually 2020, but who controls spending? So moving up then to the late 1500s, we come to the King Henry VIII. We have his one daughter, Elizabeth, and we want to talk about Elizabeth. So she is the monarch from 1558 to 1603. <clears throat> and Parliament does have the power to tax and amend bills, but she had the prerogative. She has her choices on foreign policy. Now what Henry did and what Elizabeth did, if they didn't want to ask Parliament for money because Parliament controlled the purse strings, then they just simply use their own personal money. They use their own personal money, which is something Elizabeth did. This is important because we're going to get to the next king who will not have that personal wealth to use to act as he wanted. So Elizabeth here is his redhead. She's the queen of England under, let's say, Shakespeare. You've done the Elizabethan period. Um, she does not get married. Therefore, she has no successor. But her cousin then will inherit the throne. And he technically is what we call a steward. And so we're going to talk about James I and Charles I here today. Our next class, we'll talk about Charles II and James II. They're all part of this time period known as the English Revolution. But again, it's because Elizabeth had no children. She never married. She doesn't have children. It passes to her cousin. So her cousin is James. And I'm going to take a break here for a second. And I wanted to lay out here for you, these are how I see some five simple steps, like five steps to the English Revolution. So the questions I've given you and the lecture notes that I've given you are based around these five phases. Your textbook is not. Your textbook's lining up with it pretty well, but doesn't have these five specific phases. What I'd like to do in this lesson here is talk about James I and Charles I. And then steps three, four, and five will save for another day. So remember, James I becomes king after Elizabeth dies. He's her cousin. He'd actually already been the king of Scotland he comes into England and he speaks to their parliament. One of the houses in the English parliament is the House of Lords, the other is the House of Commons. And we look at this quote by him. He's like, I'm surprised my ancestors should ever permit such an institution to come into existence. So he's surprised that parliament exists. This is the first thing we want to understand about James I. He doesn't think parliament should exist. I mention this because, you know, this reflects, this quote reflects really his attitude. James I believes in divine right of kings, and he faces some other problems in addition. 
so we have a whole bunch of information here. But on your lecture notes, the first thing you want to say, he believes in divine right, meaning he answers to God, not to Parliament. You know, Elizabeth worked with the Parliament. They seem to have some sort of, they had a good relationship, or so it's perceived. James has several problems. The debt, he doesn't quite understand English customs. He's more pro-Catholic than the people wanted him to be, and therefore he clashes with Parliament. On your paper, I wrote down a couple of things, but he does believe in divine right. His personality is sorely lacking. As he's coming into London, his aide tells him to wave to the crowds of people that are there to uh, welcome him, and he wants to drop his bridges and show his arse, meaning he wants to moon the crowd. So we also see his personality is, is rough and that he doesn't quite fit that status that Elizabeth had, uh, that regal, majestic status in being uh, king. He also clashes with Parliament. Um, of course, they resist his claim to divine right. So if he wants money, he has to ask Parliament. He's irritating Parliament quickly. He wants to be friendly with Spain, which goes against their traditional thinking at this point under Elizabeth. Um, and he has a whole group of people who dissent in his country. And those people will be called Puritans. They want to purify the English church, make it less like the Catholic church. So a couple of things that we should know. He is absolutist. He has a foreign policy that goes against traditional thinking there. And he's got a group of people who dissent. We're going to call them Puritans. They're going to purify the Church of England, make it less like the Catholic Church. If you want, you can take a moment to pause this video and then write some of that stuff down on your lecture notes. It's always a good policy for you guys to follow here. So James goes against what Henry VIII and Elizabeth had done and working together as a balance to rule the state. And we know he alienates the Puritans, and the Puritans are... This new group of people in England we're going to call it gentry, or they are the uh, rich landowners who are not quite nobles, but wealthy, successful business people. And they make up part of the House of Commons. <clears throat> the last thing for James I I want us to mention is that the Bible. He has the Bible translated to English. For extra credit, you're welcome. If you find a copy of this in your house... You might have a copy of the Bible in your house. It might say the King James Version. It refers to the first English version of the Bible. He has it translated, 1611. So we're about 100 years after Martin Luther here. So James dies peacefully without a hitch. In comes his son. His son is called Charles. Now Charles comes in with a bit of a chip on his shoulder. He saw how Parliament and his father interacted, and he is not happy with how Parliament treated his father. And he also believes in divine right. In addition, he's exceptionally pro-Catholic, and he's under all these rituals and ceremonies, which would be very Catholic-seeming versus what some of the Protestants want to be, which would be a little simpler, a uh, little simpler services and structure. So he and Parliament will clash. On your note page, I said I put he ruled without Parliament in a very arbitrary manner. Arbitrary here meaning very random. So Charles needs money, and how does he get it? and I put the pound symbol there in the, in the lecture that, in the PowerPoint, usually they would fund his wars, but sometimes they would not support his actions. So what he t tends to do is dissolve the parliament and rules without it. He tries to get the funds in other ways. How does he get funds? Well, he forces people to loan him money. He sells off titles of nobility. And he does this to, um, to get the money to act however he wants without parliament's say. He will also throw his enemies in jail without a trial. That is a contradiction of a Magna Carta. On your paper that I, I put, he's finally forced to call Parliament in 1628 because he needs, to, he needs money. Okay, he desperately needs money. He's going to have to raise taxes, right, to fund his wars. Now, on your paper, I put two things for you to write down. What does this petition of rights say? What does it really say? So, again, this was in your... Acts of Parliament assignment, but Parliament, he has to go to Parliament for money. Parliament's like, we'll give you money, but you have to agree to this. And what are the things the people of England want? They want their basic rights they saw was English people. people some rights they had since 1215, 400 years. So you couldn't just imprison us without due cause. That goes against the Magna Carta. You can't go against, you can't tax without our consent. Again, that was a, something that developed in the 1200s. You can't force us to put soldiers in private homes and no martial law during peacetime. I mean, you can't abridge our laws in peacetime. 
So on your lecture notes, I asked you to strike two of those things down. There are four listed here. So Parliament, you know, when I look at this, Parliament's asking, and Parliament is trying to reassert the traditional powers of England. Charles does not agree. You know, some of these rights have been around for 400 years. Parliament's trying to reassert it. So Parliament, you know, what does Charles do? Well, look, I read on your paper, and I have it here. He signs it. He basically ignores it. He dismisses Parliament, not to call him in session for a long period of time. And then he continues to revive the Catholic Church, and he's a strict Anglican, didn't allow other Protestant churches to exist. He also is going to impose his Anglican faith upon the people of Scotland, which will irritate them. So, this imposing of the Anglican Church in Scotland will be a real problem. So we have a rebellion in Scotland then. He needs money because he wants to go to war with France. He's got Parliament in session 1640. The members of Parliament want more protection of property. Charles will not agree. He has to dismiss them. And what's going to happen is Parliament's going to come into session and finally in 1640 because Scotland will invade England. So on your paper, your lecture notes on the English Revolution, with the Scottish invasion in 1640, it's really about the Anglicans of England versus the Presbyterians of Scotland. He has to call the Parliament into session because he needs to raise money for a war. But who's sitting in this Parliament? But the people who don't like Charles I, let's call them Puritans. That's the blank you want to fill in there. <clears throat> so I have a lot of details here, but I want to focus on Charles goes into the House of Commons to arrest five members of Parliament who were his enemies, most radical members of this, of this group. He is not able to do that. And so now we have a civil war breaking out. The civil war then is within the people of England, the royalists on one side, and the parliamentarians on the other side. We're going to call them the roundheads versus the cavaliers. So the royalists are people who support the king. Remember, they, they rode on horseback, the cavalry. They're members of the House of Lords, more of the aristocracy. And the parliamentarians, or the roundheads, will be led by Lord, uh, by Charles, excuse me, by Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell. And he's a member of the House of Commons, and he's a Puritan. So we have the Civil War, and we have little toys to represent them also. The roundheads were called the roundheads because they did not wear those white wigs at the time. Oliver Cromwell <clears throat> becomes the leader of them, and he's the leader as he rose up through the military, the new model army, and he will defeat the royal forces and capture the government. Capture, excuse me, capture the king, Charles I. And here's a reenactment where he's captured the Battle of Naseby in 1645. He is handed over to Parliament. Parliament puts him on trial. They find him guilty of treason, and they behead him. This is the end of the, of the English Civil War. The King of England is beheaded, Charles I. This sends a message out to everyone across Europe that no ruler could claim absolute power and ignore the rule of law. Now, this is the English perspective, but as you know from our previous studies, Louis XIV, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, the Prussians, the Austrians, they're all still using absolutism as a method.